The Rise of El Chapo and the Sinaloa Cartel El Chapo and the Sinaloa Cartel have become names that most people associate with drugs, violence, and crime. Tons of drugs were shipped worldwide under his reign, and he escaped two maximum security prisons and became one of history's most notorious drug lords. Joaquin Archelvado Guzman Loera, commonly known as El Chapo. El Chapo translates as shorty and is readily associated with the man's height, but that didn't stop him from becoming one of the most notorious not just on the streets, but in the world. He was a Mexican drug lord and the leader of one of the most famous crime syndicates in the world, the Sinaloa Cartel. According to many sources, he was then one of the most powerful drug traffickers in the world until he was finally sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years on July 17, 2019, after escaping from several prisons. He was born on April 4, 1957, in the small village of La Tuna, in Badira Guato municipality in the Mexico state of Sinaloa, Joaquin. Like most crime lords, El Chapo was born into a low-income family with his father Emilio Guzman Bustillos and his mother Maria Consuelo Loera Perez. The official profession of his father was cattle rancher, but according to some sources, he was also engaged in farming opium poppy. He had six younger siblings even though there are rumors that three of his older brothers died of natural causes when Joaquin was young. His surviving siblings consisted of two sisters, Armida and Bernada, and four brothers, Miguel Angel, Aureliano, Arturo, and Emilio. As the oldest among his siblings, there would have been a lot of pressure on Joaquin to care for them, but there's not much out there about the early years of Joaquin. The little known about Joaquin shows that he dropped out of school in grade three to sell oranges and work with his father. As a child, he was often abused physically, so he sometimes had to run to his maternal grandmother for refuge. However, as a big brother, he often stood up to his father to prevent his younger siblings from being beaten and found his mother's love as his emotional support. With school out of the picture and few employment opportunities in Latuna, he fully turned his time and effort into the cultivation of opium poppy, which was a common practice at the time. His father would sell the kilos of poppy that he and his brother had cut down from the hills of Badira Guato and sell it to the other suppliers in Culiacan and Gamochil. Aside from all his hard work, his father often spent the money on women and alcohol and sometimes returned home with no money. At age 15 and tired of his father's irresponsible money management, Joaquin began cultivating his own marijuana farm with some of his cousins to support his family. However, when he was still a teenager, his father kicked him out of the house and he went to live with his grandfather. During this period, he gained the name El Chapo due to his shorty body stature. Even though life as an opium poppy farmer wasn't that much fun, most of the men in the village worked in Sierra Madre Occidental poppy fields their entire lifetime. But unlike these men, Joaquin, through his uncle Pedro Aviles Perez, one of Mexico's drug trafficking pioneers, left Badira Guato in his 20s. Instead, he joined organized crime in search of greater heights. Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, who was also known as El Padrino, or the Godfather, Rafael Caro Quintero, Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo, Dal Neto, and Juan Jose Esparagosa Moreno, El Azul, were the heads of the leading crime syndicate in Mexico in the 1980s. Joaquin worked in the 1970s with the drug lord Hector El Guero Palma by transporting drugs and also handled the overseeing shipments from the Sierra Madre region to some urban areas near the Mexico-US border. Joaquin was an ambitious drug dealer and always pressed his bosses to increase the drugs they smuggled across the border. According to psychologists, children who suffer violent physical abuse, or any other form of abuse for that matter, sometimes carry the trauma with them as they grow up and are likely to exhibit it on someone else when they grow up. It is therefore not surprising that Joaquin was a very violent drug dealer who always made sure he cut loose ends by killing people who became a threat to his occupation. His customers learned this of him, so they were all afraid of forfeiting their agreements with him even when they had another sweet offer from Joaquin's competitors. Because of his no-nonsense fashion of doing business, he gained the admiration of the leaders of the Guadalajara cartel. In the early 1980s, they introduced him to Felix Gallardo, one of Mexico's major drug lords at that time. Joaquin started as a chauffeur for Gallardo until he was moved up the ranks to oversee the coordination and shipment of drugs from Colombia to Mexico by land, sea, and air. After observing his work ethic for some time, Guzman was finally invited by Felix Gallardo to work under him directly. Throughout these periods, the drug traffickers in Mexico were middlemen for the big Colombian drug cartels. They helped them transfer cocaine through the U.S.-Mexico border due to their proximity. The Colombian drug traffickers were shipping most of their drugs to the Caribbean and the Florida corridor, so Mexico was just a secondary route for them. However, in the 1980s, the United States increased its security measures and drug surveillance, and this caused significant pressure for the Medellin and Cali cartels, who were trafficking across the Caribbean to devise an alternative route. At this point, Mexico was the only option these cartels had, so they put Felix in charge of their drug shipments, giving him more power and authority in Mexico. 
This was also when Mexican organized crime groups began to gain more leverage over their Central and Southern American counterparts. In the 1980s, the Drug Enforcement Administration of the United States was conducting an undercover operation in Mexico. During this operation, most DEA agents worked under various cartel groups and exchanged information with their supervisors on these drug lords. One such agent was Enrique Camarena Salazar, who worked with some of the famous drug lords at the time, including Felix Gallardo. Based on the information provided by Enrique, the Mexican military in November 1984 raided a large marijuana plantation owned by the Guadalajara cartel, known as Ranch Buffalo. It is unclear how Gallardo knew Enrique was the rat, but he and his men kidnapped, tortured, and killed Agent Enrique in 1985. The death of Enrique Camarena provoked both the United States and the Mexican governments, and a massive manhunt was carried out to capture all those involved in this act. This period was good for Guzman because he used this period to gain more responsibilities and increase his regional operations. In 1989, Guzman's boss Felix Gallardo was finally arrested, but through his connections he arranged a summit with all his stakeholders in Acapulco, Guerrero. The main thing that was discussed during the summit was the future of the drug trafficking business in Mexico. All the stakeholders agreed to divide the territories owned by the Guadalajara cartel. The Tijuana Corridor and parts of Baja California were controlled by the newly formed Tijuana cartel, which the Ariano Felix brothers headed. The Carrillo Fuentes family formed the Juarez cartel in Chihuahua state, and the remaining territories in Sinaloa and the Pacific coast were controlled by the Sinaloa cartel headed by Ishmael El Mayo Zavada, Palma, and Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. The territory gave rise to the Sinaloa cartel. After several years of being in operations, Guzman bought several properties across the country and registered them under the false names of the people he trusted well. Most of these properties were in the residential neighborhoods of Mexico, and some were used as stash houses for his drugs, cash, and weapons. He also owned several ranches across the country, but most were in the Sinaloa, Durango, Sonora, and Chihuahua states. Most of the people who worked in the ranches for Guzman were opium and marijuana farmers. In 1987, Guzman came on the radar of the United States law enforcement after several protected witnesses testified that he was the leader of the Sinaloa cartel. As a result, Arizona issued an indictment that alleged Guzman had coordinated the shipment of 2,000 kilograms of marijuana and about 4,700 kilograms of cocaine from October 19, 1987 to May 1990, and had received roughly $1.5 million in drug proceeds. Another indictment alleged that he had trafficked 3,200 kilograms of cocaine and earned about $100,000 within three years. Guzman pioneered tunnels to move drugs across the U.S.-Mexico border without law enforcement noticing it. Aside from that, he also moved his drugs in small quantities across land and air, and sometimes packed them in chili cans. At the airport, he paid several customs officers to smoothly handle the movement of his workers in and out of the United States and Mexico. Some of the other tactics he used included the shipment of the cans on trains from Mexico to the U.S. and receiving his money back in large suitcases. Guzman's cartel was involved in producing and distributing methamphetamine, heroin, ecstasy, and marijuana. Not long after that, they expanded their operations to five continents and about 50 different countries, and as a result, became one of the most powerful drug traffickers in the world. On June 9, 1993, Guzman was finally caught by the authorities in Guatemala and was extradited to Mexico where he was sentenced to 20 years in a maximum security prison on several murder and drug charges. While behind bars, El Chapo continued to oversee the operations of the Sinaloa cartel by bribing the officials. Because of that, he was able to arrange for meetings and visits and sometimes invited prostitutes into the prison. After a ruling by the Supreme Court of Mexico in 2001 to make the extradition between the United States and Mexico easier, Guzman escaped from prison. He was wheeled out of prison inside a dirty laundry basket, and this escape is rumored to have cost him $2.5 million. According to history.co.uk, over 70 guards were implicated, including the warden, who is now in prison for the party played in El Chapo's escape. The United States government placed a reward of $5 million for anyone who could share information of the whereabouts of El Chapo. Still, he could avoid law enforcement for 13 years until he was arrested in 2014. After that, he was tagged as the leading drug trafficker of all time by the Drug Enforcement Agency. His rise to the top saw the birth of many drug wars, which caused the death of thousands of individuals. On February 22, 2014, El Chapo was captured in a hotel in a beachfront area of Mazatlan, Sinaloa, after a large multi-country operation. The Mexican government refused the extradition request from the United States at the time. The president said another escape would be more than regrettable. It would be unforgivable for the government not to take the precautions to ensure that what happened last time would not be repeated. A little over a year after he was arrested, El Chapo slipped down a shaft under the shower area in his prison and escaped through a mile-long ventilated tunnel, which was said to have been constructed over a year. 
This time around, El Chapo's freedom was short-lived as authorities caught up to him on January 8, 2016 in Los Mochis, Sinaloa. He was sent to a prison facility in Juarez, right on the U.S. border. The Mexican government approved the extradition request this time, but Guzman and his lawyers filed for an appeal. His appeal was won to transfer him back to the prison he escaped from earlier. Then, in October 2016, the judge presiding over Guzman's extradition case, Vicente Antonio Zacarias, was murdered. Later, in January 2017, Guzman was extradited into the United States, where he pleaded not guilty to all counts against him in Brooklyn, New York. His lawyers stated that Joaquin was not a drug leader, as claimed by the prosecutors. His trial began on November 5, 2018, and lasted until February 2019. After several deliberations, the jury returned a guilty verdict on all counts on February 12, 2019. Due to his violent traits, all the jurors were heavily protected. He was finally sentenced to life in prison on July 17, 2019. Due to the criminal history of Guzman, the exact number of wives and children he had cannot be specifically stated. Still, it is estimated that he had at least four children and 11 grandchildren. El Chapo will be a name both feared and remembered for many years to come. After being tagged as the leading drug trafficker in the world, chances are that the man won't make it out of prison alive this time.